Good morning. My name is Neelish Patel. I'm an assistant professor of emergency medicine at New York Medical College, and I'm also the program director of the emergency medicine residency at St. Joseph's Regional Medical Center here in Patterson, New Jersey. And the topic for today's talk is acute porphyria attacks in the emergency department. I do have one financial disclosure to make in giving this lecture. I, do, I am on a speaker bureau and I speak for a pharmaceutical company called CSL Bearing. The therapy that I speak about for them is Kcentra, which is a four-factor prothrombin complex concentrate. I have no other financial disclosures to make in giving this talk on porphyrus today, and we will not be discussing PCCs at all in this talk. So let's get started uh, with this talk. Here are the objectives for the lecture. The first objective is to recognize the signs and symptoms of an acute porphyria attack in order to promptly diagnose and treat them in the emergency department. The second objective is to discuss those treatments, both current and emergent treatments for acute porphyria attacks. And finally, discuss complications associated with porphyrias and their treatment. So let's get started on those objectives. So why are we even talking about porphyria and acute porphyria attacks in this lecture today? Well, it's a rare disease. And because it's where we are not familiar with it in the emergency department, we don't see it very often. And so it's important for us to be familiar with the way acute porphyria attacks present in order to make the diagnosis and treat these patients appropriately. The other reason we're talking about it today is acute porphyria attacks present in a way that many other diseases present in the emergency department. So the most common symptom patients present with, with an acute porphyria attack is severe acute abdominal pain with nausea and vomiting. And we see plenty of other diseases that present this way. And so our differential is going to be very broad when patients come in with severe abdominal pain. There are other symptoms of an acute porphyria attack, and we will discuss them later in the lecture. And I'll give you pearls on how to start to suspect this diagnosis and then make uh, the diagnosis with lab testing. So again, it's a rare entity that presents with a common symptom. And because of that, uh, it's important to discuss. This is a complicated diagram of the heme biosynthesis pathway. And this is the heme that makes up hemoglobin. And you can see there's multiple metabolic precursors in this pathway. For instance, we have porphobilinogen and other metabolic precursors. And the ultimate end product is the formation of heme. And along this pathway, there's catalytic enzymes that convert one metabolic precursor to the other. And so what a porphyria is, it's a genetic inherited, usually inherited disease, uh, which decreases the catalytic activity of one of the enzymes along this pathway. Therefore, there's a buildup of the metabolic precursor prior to that enzyme. And due to that buildup of the metabolic precursor, patients have symptoms. So there's multiple different types of porphyrias, and it depends on which catalytic enzyme has decreased activity. So again, the porphyrias are a group of metabolic disorders whereby there's decreased activity of one of the catalytic enzymes along the heme biosynthesis pathway. And so it depends on which enzyme has decreased activity. Now, for the most part, porphyrias are inherited. It's an autosomal dominant inheritance with variable expression some of them are actually acquired. And so you can see some of the uh, porphyrias listed here. And what we'll discuss today are the acute porphyrias. And there's four main acute porphyrias listed here. Acute intermittent porphyria, also known as AIP. And this is the most common one. Variegate porphyria, VP. Hereditary copra porphyria, which is HCP. And finally, the very rare ALAD deficient porphyria. You can also see that there's an acquired porphyria listed here. But the goal of this talk is to talk about the acute porphyrias, the four ones that are listed on this slide. And the reason is these are the ones that present with crisis. These are the ones that we'll see in the emergency department. And these are the ones that actually carry a mortality risk. And so those are the ones we'll discuss. Now, you can classify all of the porphyrias as acute or non-acute. And again, we're going to discuss the acute porphyrias today. Uh, the non-acute porphyrias tend to present more with cutaneous manifestations, which are self-limited, whereas the ones we're discussing today, the acute porphyrias, tend to present with a neurovisceral crisis, 
We'll talk about what those neurosymptoms are, and the visceral symptoms tend to be severe abdominal pain. Another way to classify the porphyrias is classify them as erythropoietic or hepatic. Heme synthesis occurs in the bone marrow, and it occurs in the liver. So depending where the process is affected, again, you can classify them as erythropoiet or hepatic. The acute porphyrias we'll discuss today are all hepatic porphyrias. So now that we know what porphyrias are, which is a group of metabolic disorders along the heme biosynthesis pathway, let's take a look at that complicated pathway again. And you're going to see I'm going to highlight where the four acute porphyrias actually occur. Where is there decreased enzyme activity? Which metabolic precursors actually build up? So if you take a look here, here's one of the enzymes that has decreased activity, ALA dehydratase, which is the least common of the acute porphyrias. Inhibition there leads to a buildup of ALA. And you'll see the other ones depicted on this slide. So again, along this pathway, there is a genetic predisposition, decreased activity of an enzyme, therefore increase of the metabolic precursor, which then leads to symptoms of an acute porphyria attack. So again, we know what an acute porphyria is, and patients get acute porphyria attacks or an acute crisis. But the actual pathogenesis of this is somewhat poorly understood. Why do patients get that acute attack? So here are some of the theories. One of the theories is there's a buildup of the metabolic precursor, as we've discussed, and that is a toxic substance, both to the abdomen and as well as to the neuronal tissue. And so there's deposition of these metabolites. Another thought process is because of these increased metabolites along the pathway, patients develop oxygen-free radicals, which then cause tissue damage. So it's poorly understood, but these are some of the theories. So we mentioned one of the metabolic precursors that builds up is ALA, if you remember from the heme biosynthesis pathway. And all of the acute porphyrias, regardless of which one it is, leads to a buildup of this precursor called ALA. And it's thought ALA is responsible for a lot of the neurotoxic symptoms in an acute porphyria attack. And again, we'll discuss what those neurotoxic symptoms are later on in this lecture. And so the thought is, is ALA crosses the blood-brain barrier at specific points, and it it's directly toxic to the neuronal vasculature, leading to vascular, increased vascular permeability, uh, and other symptoms such as edema, which then causes neurosymptoms, including encephalopathy. So it's thought that ALA is the uh, metabolite that causes the most neuronal toxicity as far as the acute porphyrias go. If you remember back, we're talking about the four acute porphyrias. There was one acquired porphyria, which inhibits the enzyme, which then leads to a buildup of ALA. And that acquired porphyria, which we're not going to spend a lot of time on, is actually lead poisoning. So lead poisoning is an acquired porphyria, inhibits an enzyme ALA dehydratase, which then leads to a buildup of this metabolic precursor, ALA, just for a frame of reference. As far as the pathogenesis of an acute porphyria attack, there's very often a trigger for a patient to get an attack. And you can see on this diagram some of the common triggers. A lot of the triggers actually promote the synthesis of heme or stimulate heme-containing P, cytochrome P450 enzymes in the liver, leading to a stimulation of the heme biosynthesis pathway. So a lot of the triggers uh, are a result of needing increased heme or hemoglobin in the body. And because of these triggers, we think patients have an acute porphyria attack. So some of the triggers, again, most commonly are listed here, including medications, illicit substances and alcohol, infectious processes, a fasting state or low caloric intake, uh, as well as pregnancy, and finally hormonal changes, including menses. And important for us in the emergency department to be aware of these triggers. Most acute porphyria attacks have a trigger, although some do not. And one that we really need to be aware of, which we'll discuss in depth, is medications. Because if a patient comes in with an acute porphyria attack, not only do we need to try to recognize that a medication was a trigger, we want to avoid medications that can worsen the attack. So some of the medications are listed here that are known to trigger 
acute porphyria attacks or a crisis, and you can see this list is very long. And in fact, the list is longer than this. There's a few websites listed at the bottom of the slide. You can reference them for all of the medications that may be triggers, and this list does change. And you can see some of the medications that we commonly use in the emergency department listed on this slide. So some of these medications are chronic meds that patients may be on, and some of them we may use in the ED for acute treatment. So some of the medications, again, listed here include sedatives like ketamine, anesthetics like lidocaine, oral contraceptives, RSI agents such as etomidate, and there's antibiotics, anticonvulsants, and the list goes on. So again, be aware that medications are a common trigger for a crisis. I mentioned hormonal changes or menses, another very common trigger. In fact, menses is thought to be the most common trigger in women of an acute porphyria crisis. Typically, these patients get mild attacks because these attacks can be mild to severe. Uh, however, again, a, a well-known trigger. And interestingly, OCPs are sometimes used to treat acute porphyria attacks due to menses because the interesting part of this is OCPs is identified as a trigger in some patients, but it also can use, be used as a treatment in patients. Pregnancy, again, also can be a trigger, particularly uh, during delivery or the postpartum period, so we need to be aware of this in our pregnant patients. And another trigger I want to emphasize is infection. This is a pretty common trigger of an acute porphyria crisis. And so when we see patients and we suspect it could be an acute porphyria attack, we want to rule out infection and potentially cover patients with empiric antibiotics. So we'll talk a little bit more about the triggers as we move through this lecture. Let's get into another objective, which is the clinical signs and symptoms of disease. Across the board for the acute porphyria, the most common symptom patients present with is acute, severe, excruciating, abdominal pain, and it's been reported that the abdominal pain of a crisis mimics an acute abdomen. There's other symptoms, but this is by far the most common one. And when we think about that, we see plenty of patients with severe abdominal pain in the emergency department. So in a, when a patient comes in, what's the differential? It could be an acute abdomen. Now, I also mentioned acute porphyria attacks present with neuro and psychiatric symptoms, and we'll discuss what those symptoms are but they include things like anxiety, restlessness, depression, apathy, encephalopathy, and motor weakness, potentially or usually proximal motor weakness. So other things that may mimic an acute porphyria attack, uh, DKA, psychosis can actually be the presenting complaint, hypertensive crisis because patients get autonomic instability, including tachycardia and hypertension, and then Guillain-Barre syndrome. So a lot of patients will present with motor weakness, and that motor weakness can progress to all of their extremities, and this can be mistaken for GBS. So it's a bit confusing. In the emergency department, we're often juggling multiple di differential diagnoses on patients. And what's difficult with the acute porphyria attack is they can present with symptoms of abdominal pain, most commonly, neurologic symptoms, and psychiatric symptoms, and it's sometimes hard to put those together as you saw on that differential diagnosis. So we have to have a high index of suspicion. If a patient comes in with abdominal pain and neuropsych symptoms, have a high index of suspicion and think this could be an acute porphyria crisis. Some uh, clinical facts to know with uh, acute porphyria. Typically, uh, the peak age of presentation for an attack is age 30. Okay, and so most patients do not present with symptoms early on in life in the pre-puberty and puberty stages. Much more common in women, about four to one occurrence more commonly in women. And although this is a predominantly an inherited disease or genetic disease, only about 10 to 15 percent of patients with porphyria will actually have an acute attack during their life, which means 85 to 90 percent of patients who have a porphyria will not present with an acute attack. So why is that? That's the case because there's variable expression. So there's a continuum of disease and there's variable expression. So patients may come in and they don't have 
the diagnosis in acute porphyria because they've never had an attack. In fact, most patients don't. Interestingly, when patients come to the ED, about two-thirds of them will have a family history of a porphyria, which means one-third won't. And that makes sense because, again, this disease can be latent, as I mentioned, in 85 to 90 percent of patients. So again, ask about family history, although don't hang your hat on it. Realize that you may see patients as a first presenter. And then acute porphyria crises have a variable presentation. Uh, they can have, patients can have a single attack during their life or they can have multiple attacks. And when patients have an attack, they can have multiple attacks within days to weeks and present that way. Less than 10% of patients will actually have recurrent attacks. So for a patient with an acute porphyria, the, sort of the course is the majority of them will never have an attack, some will, and most that do will have a solitary attack and not recurrent attacks. Also, again, always look for triggers, medications, infection, hormonal changes, inquire about these things. So again, the most common symptom is acute severe abdominal pain. This is a study out of Taiwan. It looked at 32 patients, it was prospective observational, who presented with acute porphyria attacks to emergency department. Ten of these patients were uh, new onsets on their presentation, and all of them had acute abdominal pain. Most of them had nausea, vomiting. None of them had fever, and the majority of them required opiate pain medications for control of their symptoms. So all these patients had abdominal pain, most common symptom. The most common location of the pain and tenderness was the epigastrum. I mentioned the neuropsych symptoms that patients can present with, with a crisis. And so this is a slide referring to that. And so most acute attacks are preceded by mild neuropsych symptoms such as anxiety, insomnia, irritability, and then patients' neurosymptoms can then progress. Now again, attacks are variable. Some patients don't get a lot of neurosymptoms. Some patients do. Uh, the symptoms that you can see or patients can progress to include sensory changes, motor weakness. Again, usually it starts proximally, and that motor weakness can then involve all four extremities where a porphyria may mimic something such as a Guillain-Barre, and patients can present as a paralysis. And that motor weakness can then move on to involve other muscles of the body, including the diaphragm, and patients can develop respiratory fatigue and potentially respiratory failure. A proportion of patients also get encephalopathy and seizure, and of course there's a mortality associated with acute porphyria attacks. So again, to summarize the neurosymptoms, psychiatric symptoms such as anxiety, depression, uh, can progress to motor weakness, sensory changes, and always be monitoring patients' respiratory status. In the past, the mortality of patients with an acute porphyria attack in the literature was reported as 10 to 15 percent, which is quite high. In recent literature, the mortality is reported to be about 1 to 2 percent, and this mortality is mainly due to respiratory failure. So again, be very vigilant in monitoring patients' respiratory status when they present with an acute porphyria attack. In fact, all of these patients likely require admission to the hospital for monitoring. And so 1 to 2 percent mortality, not insignificant, much improved from prior literature. Here's a table listing all of the symptoms of an acute porphyria attack. Again, you can see abdominal pain leads the way. 97 to 98% of patients will present with acute abdominal pain. Tachycardia, so again, these patients often have autonomic dysfunction, so they'll present with tachycardia and hypertension. I have dark urine listed here. We haven't alluded to that in this lecture, but patients with acute porphyrias will have a discoloration of their urine from the metabolic precursors. Now, if that urine sits out and is exposed to light, the urine will become darker. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. So if you have a patient that actually gives you a urine sample and the urine gets darker as it's sitting out in light, think this is an acute porphyria attack. You can see the neuro symptoms listed here, including peripheral motor neuropathy, about 40 to 60 percent of patients, hypertension, hyponatremia, we'll talk about in the next few slides. And at the bottom there, you see seizures uh, and chest pain listed as well. So a, a variable presentation, but the most common symptoms, again, 
acute abdominal pain, sensory motor symptoms, psychiatric symptoms, vital sign abnormalities, and a dark urine. Lab abnormalities, very nonspecific. Uh, you saw on the previous slide about 25 to 30 percent of patients with an acute porphyria attack will have hyponatremia. And this is usually due to volume loss from nausea, vomiting, but it can also be from inappropriate secretion of ADH. And interestingly, the hyponatremia can also contribute to the mental status changes that these patients have. Hypomagnesemia can also be seen as well as rhabdomyolysis. Now, patients can have rhabdomyolysis or an elevated CPK with an acute porphyria, and it can also be on the differential because with a rhabdo, patients also will have a dark urine, so keep that on your differential diagnosis. And then monitor the renal function of these patients. Uh, a small percentage of them can develop acute kidney injury, usually from volume losses. So again, you've, we've went through the symptoms of an acute porphyria attack. You have to have a high index of suspicion. Uh, remember the common symptoms that you see. Overall, this is a rare diagnosis. Inquire about family history and triggers. And if your suspicion is increased enough, you're going to have to confirm the diagnosis with testing. So what is the testing? So the test of choice is really a urine for porphobilinogens, which is one of the metabolic precursors. I'll refer to porphobilinogens as PBG for simplicity's sake. So all of the acute porphyrias, the four acute porphyrias that we're going to mainly see in the emergency department, lead to an increase in the PBG. Actually, three of them do. I take that back. The one that doesn't as much is the ALAD. But the ALAD porphyria is very rare. It's extremely rare. So if you suspect an ALAD acute porphyria, uh, consultant consultation is recommended uh, because that is uh, more specialized testing. However, the other acute porphyrias, including the most common one, which is AIP, leads to an increase in PBJ. Also HCP and VP, all of them lead to an increase in urine PBG. And so urine PBG is your test of choice. Most institutions have either a qualitative or a semi-quantitative assay for urine PBG. And so what you'll need to do is get a urine sample from the patient. It needs to be collected in a light protected container. The reason is the urine will degrade and the metabolites will degrade if exposed to light and potentially give you a false negative test. So once you collect the urine, uh, run the assay, either the qualitative or semi-quantitative assay that your facility has. Patients with an acute porphyria, the common ones that we're going to see, will have an elevated urine PBG, 10 times the normal limit, up to within one week of an attack. So again, the urine PBG will be elevated. Now, if you get one that's elevated, and so you're suspecting this isn't acute porphyria, you're probably going to want to confirm it and repeat the urine. You can have false negatives, although it's not that common. And so repeat it, but don't delay treatment. So continue on, and we'll talk about what the treatments are. Now, also, if you get a positive urine PBG, you're going to want to collect a blood sample in an EDTA test tube, as well as a Stool sample, those also need to be light protected and those can be sent for biochemical analysis. And what the blood and stool will give you is an analysis for the actual type of porphyria that patient has. So again, to review, high index of suspicion. If you suspect a diagnosis, collect a urine and send it for urine PBG if the urine in a light protected container. If the urine PBG is positive, treat the patient. We'll go into what that is. Confirm it with another urine collect blood and stool for further testing. Now again, the one acute porphyria, ALAD, okay, the inhibition of the ALA synthase, excuse me, the ALAD enzyme, that one is very, very rare, and if you suspect that, get a consult. Treatment. Big objective in this lecture, how do you actually treat these patients? I mentioned if you suspect it, you'll get a urine and confirm it, and don't delay treatment. The two main treatments we give patients for an acute porphyria attack are to give them glucose because it's a catabolic state. Often a precipitant is fasting, so to give them glucose, and then to give them IV heme therapy. And in other countries, it's IV heme arginate, so I'll refer to that. 
And in the United States, it's a lyophilized powder known as panhematin or hematin that just needs to be reconstituted and given intravenous. And so a couple of points. In most of the literature, IV heme therapy tends to work better than glucose loading. And when I say better, it decreases the duration of an acute porphyria attack. It improves symptoms, decreases length of stay, etc. Porphyria attacks are variable. There's a small subset of patients who have mild attacks who may not need IV heme therapy and will just respond to glucose loading. But the majority of these patients who present with a neurovisceral attack will need IV heme therapy. So you can use your judgment. Uh, but again, for the moderate to severe attacks, uh, they'll probably require the IV heme. As far as the glucose load, remember, uh, both of these therapies, not only glucose but IV heme, decrease ALA, which is a metabolic precursor. They downregulate ALA synthase, which is the enzyme along the heme biosynthesis pathway. And so both of them downregulate this enzyme uh, and improve patient symptoms. The glucose load, if you're going to do it, uh, the recommended way is to do a D10 drip in normal saline. And the recommendation is to give patients about 200 grams of glucose a day during an acute attack, sometimes more than that. So here's all of the treatments. We mentioned glucose loading and we mentioned IV heme therapy. Uh, always uh, supportive care is very important. Remember, these patients can have respiratory compromise. So if they have respiratory compromise, uh, they'll may need oxygen if it's just hypoxia. If it's more significant, they may require endotracheal intubation. Remember to keep an eye to triggers. If a patient had a trigger, uh, identify it. And then try to avoid giving medications that may exacerbate the acute porphyria attack and keep an eye on medications. Now the recommendation is uh, to avoid medications during an attack that may exacerbate symptoms, but if there's an emergency medicine that you need to give the patient, then go ahead and give it. Remember, a common trigger is infection, so work these patients up for infection, including blood cultures, urine cultures, etc., and consider empiric antibiotics if infection is high on your differential diagnosis. Avoid a catabolic state. Remember, that exacerbates an acute porphyria attack. It leads to stimulation of the heme biosynthesis pathway. So fasting states, particularly, so patients are going to need carbohydrates. They're going to need a glucose load. And consider giving them a D10 drip. Supportive care in terms of electrolyte management. Remember to manage hyponatremia, hypomagnesemia, and closely watch the electrolytes, and then give patients IV heme arginate in other countries, and in this country, it's hematin or panheme, which is the lyophilized powder. So this is a nice slide going through all of the facets of management of an acute porphyria tract from the supportive care all the way down to the uh, therapies such as glucose and IV heme. So let's spend some time talking about heme therapy, which is really the mainstay. Uh, I, again, we mentioned heme arginate is used in Europe, and in this country it's hematin, which is the lyophilized powder, which you'll simply reconstitute. And so the benefit in trials is that heme therapy has been shown to improve symptoms quickly in patients compared to glucose loading. It's relatively safe, and we'll talk about the safety profile of it in the next slide. And we'll go into some of the literature uh, regarding heme therapy in the next slide as well. So again, the recommendation is if you're going to treat a patient with heme therapy, to use it early in the acute exacerbation. It tends to work better if you use it up front. The recommended dose is 3 milligrams per kilogram intravenous, and it's given once a day over a period of four days. Sometimes it's given for longer than that. And the infusion runs over about 30 minutes. Once you reconstitute the powder or you have the infusion and you're ready to run it, you should use it right away because as it's exposed, it can also degrade as well. So once you reconstitute, use it right away. And the recommendation is to give it through a large bore IV or a central line. And the reason is, is the heme therapy causes thrombophlebitis. It's irritating to the veins. This is one of the biggest complications 
of heme therapy, and it's due to the formation of heme agglutinins in the therapy. And so again, give it through a large bore IV, consider a central line. Uh, the side effects of heme therapy include thrombophobitis, which we mentioned, irritating to the veins, can cause coagulopathy, and there are reports of anaphylaxis, although that's not common. So a little bit more on the thrombophobitis. If you look at the literature on heme therapy, there's a recommendation to consider giving it with albumin. So to reconstitute the heme powder with albumin and then to infuse it that way. And the reason is by doing that you decrease the formation of hemagglutinins which are thought to cause the thrombophlebitis. So you can reconstitute it uh, the, the way with saline which is, rec which is one way or you can reconstitute it with the albumin. So let's look at three trials uh, that look at heme therapy for acute porphyria attacks. So this is a trial out of the Archives of Internal Medicine from 1993. And these were all patients with acute porphyria crisis. Uh, this was, uh, uh, I believe, over 50 patients. And they were all treated with a heme arginate infusion. And they were all treated within 24 hours of their acute porphyria attack. And what was found was patients had decreased symptoms when they were treated with IV heme arginate within 24 hours of their attack. So they had about two and a half days of abdominal pain uh, and opiates were needed for about 2.8 to three days. And when we look historically back, most attacks patients had pain longer than two and a half days and required opiates for a longer period of time. So this seemed to decrease symptoms of an acute porphyria attack, decrease opiate use for acute porphyria attacks, and these patients spent less time in the hospital. Now, the majority of these patients required hospitalization, but historically, looking at previous trials, they spent less time in the hospital. So it seemed to improve outcomes. There was one case of thrombophlebitis in these patients treated with IV hemogenate. So, from this trial, what we can take home is if you're going to use IV heme therapy, use it early. Okay, it's reserved for moderate severe attacks, but if you make that diagnosis, use it up front because it tends to have a better bang for the buck up front. This is a trial from the American Journal uh, of uh, Medicine from 2006. This was a larger trial. This was over 100 patients with over 300 acute porphyria attacks. And this was an open label prospective trial. And this actually looked at hematin, which is the lyophilized powder we have here available in the US for the treatment of an acute crisis. So what we use is what this trial looked at. So again, over 100 patients, over 300 attacks, and they all got IV heme therapy. And of all these patients, about three quarters of them, all of their tracts responded to IV heme therapy. And in about 85% of them, one of their attacks responded well to IV heme therapy. So in the majority of these patients, IV heme therapy decreased hospitalization stay, decreased the duration of symptoms, decreased opiate use, and helped patients with their attack. Now in this cohort of patients, there was four deaths okay, from the acute porphyria. So remember, this carries a mortality, and that mortality is from respiratory failure no doubt, none of those four deaths were thought to be attributed to treatment with IV heme. They were all thought to be due to the severity of the acute porphyria attack. So you can see the data is limited. This is a rare disease, and the data for IV heme therapy is limited, but it does show a potential benefit. This is one trial you might come across from the Lancet 1989, and this is a trial that doesn't show as much of a benefit for IV heme therapy, so I want to give you both ends of the spectrum here. And so this was actually a double-blind, placebo-controlled trial, 21 patients who presented with an acute porphyria attack. And again, 21 patients treated with either IV heme arginate therapy or placebo. And in this small trial, they found no statistically significant difference in pain scores, the amount of opiate required, or hospital length of stay in patients who got IV heme therapy compared to placebo. So this showed that IV heme therapy did not improve those parameters we just discussed. Now, a couple of things about this trial. 
in the patients who got IV heme therapy, they had a trend towards in these outcomes. So although there wasn't a statistically significant benefit, they tended to need less opioid analgesia, they tended to spend less time in the hospital, and they tended to have lower pain scores. It just didn't reach statistical significance. Also, this is a very small trial, so we have to take that into consideration, only 21 patients. And so another nice thing about this trial in favor of IV heme therapy was that they followed metabolic precursor levels. So those metabolites that build up in an acute porphyria attack that were thought to be toxic, when they look at those levels in these patients, IV heme therapy decreased those levels much more compared to placebo. So again, just to review, we covered supportive care, keep an eye on the respiratory status of these patients, monitor their electrolytes, Okay, give them a glucose load, okay, whether that's carbohydrates or IV glucose. Look to identify triggers and then avoid triggers that may worsen the acute porphyria attack. And then consider giving these patients IV heme therapy. From the limited data we have, it tends to decrease the duration of an attack, decrease symptoms, hospital stay, as well as the need for opiate medications. Now, most of these patients from the literature we look at do require opiate pain medication for control. These attacks cause very severe uh, pain. So use any of the IV opiates to control pain. Morphine is safe, uh, hydromorphone is safe, fentanyl is safe. So none of these are on the no-no list as a trigger. So use these liberally to control pain in a neurovisceral crisis. If you remember back to the symptoms table we looked at, the most common symptom being acute abdominal pain, seizure was on there. And on that table, it said about 10, I believe, to 20% of patients will have a seizure. And that's probably overstated. A seizure is not a very common complication of an acute porphyria attack. In fact, other neurosymptoms are much more common. But patients can present with seizure. And if a patient does remember that a lot of the anticonvulsants can actually exacerbate a crisis. So we have to be careful of the anti we choose. And so the recommendation really is to control the seizure with benzodiazepines because they are safe, particularly lorazepam and diazepam. Gabapentin is also safe, so use these medications and then make sure to look at the list of triggers and avoid those that could potentially exacerbate the crisis. We very briefly, another complication or special situation, we very briefly mentioned lead poisoning. Remember, lead poisoning is an acquired porphyria where the ALAD enzyme is inhibited, and that causes a buildup of ALA, but that's an acquired porphyria, and lead poisoning has specific treatments which are listed on this slide. Some of the long-term complications of having a porphyria include the following. So uh, hypertension is a big one. A lot of these patients develop hypertension, and so they need close blood pressure monitoring, close monitoring of their renal function, because a minority of them will then go on to develop chronic kidney disease and ultimately become dialysis dependent. So the recommendation is to follow the blood pressure in these patients commonly and to institute antihypertensive therapy early if they have hypertension. We mentioned patients can develop renal insufficiency as well. Uh, another long-term complication of porphyrias is hepatocellular carcinoma, particularly hepatomas. And there's actually a much higher incidence of liver CA in these patients. And in fact, it's so high that there's a recommendation that these patients that have acute uh, porphyrias be screened with imaging for hepatocellular CA and hepatomas. So keep that in mind. And then finally, a lot of these patients end up with chronic pain from their porphyria. And just to talk about that a little bit, when we talked about the clinical presentation, I'm not sure if I hammered this home, but these patients present with severe pain. They often present with neurologic symptoms and psychiatric symptoms. So they're often mislabeled as chronic abdominal pain, for instance, or chronic gastroparesis, or a psychiatric disease, or fibromyalgia or chronic headache 
And so they get these labeled diagnoses when in fact they have a porphyria. And so I uh, just realized that there's often a uh, misdiagnosis of a porphyria and the acute porphyria attacks. There's underdiagnosis because it's rare. And then oftentimes these patients get mislabeled. And then again, a complication can be chronic pain. And the, the pathogenesis of that is actually poorly understood, but this can happen. As far as future or emerging therapies, there's a few uh, that are worth mentioning. So interestingly, liver transplant. Uh, there is over 10 cases of reported liver transplant for patients with acute porphyria. And it tends to be reserved for those patients who have recurrent attacks, multiple attacks, uh, that are poorly tolerated and they don't have a good quality of life. Remember, the majority or all of the acute porphyrias are hepatic, and so there are cases of liver transplantation to treat these patients. There is recombinant human HMBS enzyme, and so this is a therapy that's been shown to lower plasma and urine PBG levels, which is the main me metabolite that builds up in the acute porphyrias. And this has been shown to lower these levels in patients who are symptom free. So in patients not having an acute attack, this therapy has been shown to decrease that metabolic precursor that may play a role in an in acute attack. So this has promise. And then finally, a therapy called small interfering RNA. And this therapy has been shown to work in animal models, not yet in humans. And what it does is it downregulates ALA synthase, which is the enzyme along the heme biosynthesis pathway. This is the same enzyme that's downregulated by glucose as well as IV heme therapy. By downregulating that enzyme, there's a decrease in ALA. Okay, and therefore patients may then potentially get less toxic buildup of metabolites and less symptoms. So again, these are sort of future treatments or emerging treatments that we can consider. So let's wrap it up, our take home points for this lecture. Have a high clinical index of suspicion for an acute porphyria attack in patients who present with severe abdominal pain and neuropsychiatric symptoms. The abdominal pain often mimics an acute abdomen. So certainly we're gonna have other things on our differential, but keep this there. And the neuro symptoms can be motor weakness, sensory deficit, psychiatric symptoms, including as severe as psychosis. Dark urine is common in these patients. Think about it in patients who are repeat visitors with abdominal pain and in patients who have a diagnosis of chronic pain or psych that doesn't fit the bill. The urine will get darker as it sits out, but consider that. And then most patients will have a family history, but not all of them. If you suspect an acute porphyria attack, get a urine, send it for PBG. Now, there are assays in most institutions for this. Remember, it needs to be in a light protected container. If the PBG is positive, don't delay treatment. You may want to reconfirm it and then confirm it with blood and stool, which can identify the actual specific porphyria that patient has. The treatment is multifaceted. First and foremost, supportive care. Watch the airway, watch the respiratory status, correct electrolytes, Remove triggers. Don't give patients medications that can exacerbate the acute porphyria attack. And then the mainstays of treatment are glucose loading, usually with D10, and then IV heme therapy, which has been shown to decrease the duration of attack, the symptoms, as well as hospitalization. Remember, IV heme therapy can cause thrombophobitis. Consider using larger bore IVs or central lines when you give this, and give it early, because the best literature supporting it shows it has a benefit when it's used early on in therapy. So I thank you for your time during this lecture on acute porphyrias. And the slides will have the references, which you can look for, listed here. Thank you very much.